There were some who found me difficult and hostile, but they did me wrong. Little did they know of the reason why I seemed that way. It wasn't my choice to shrink from society, and I had to live alone. Like someone who'd been banished. By the time his Ninth Symphony was performed that night in Vienna, Ludwig van Beethoven was profoundly deaf. Almost two centuries later, this music remains as potent, obsessive and bewilderingly brilliant as ever. It's even more remarkable when you remember that its composer was unable to hear. The struggle that comes through Beethoven's music is what makes it so compelling. And struggle was always part of his life. Just as with Shakespeare, you come to Beethoven to engage with the big questions that stir nations, that stir humanity itself. The struggle against deafness, the struggle for personal freedom on every level, the determination to be an artist on his own terms. All this I feel acutely in his music. Music which, against the odds, articulates the indomitable power of the human spirit. His music has changed lives. It's changed history. And with him, you might say, music grew up. Beethoven was born into a family of court musicians in the German city of Bonn. From an early age, he'd learned to fend for himself. Look at him. What's he so miserable for? Your mother's dead, isn't she? No, she's not. Well, she must be. Look at the state of you. His mother wasn't dead. At least, not then. I don't think his mother meant to neglect them. It wasn't as if they were poor. Certainly not when we were children. But 
I don't remember it being exactly a happy home. A gifted pianist, Beethoven had inherited the talents of his late grandfather, a renowned musician who'd been director of music at the court. Unlike young Ludwig, his father Johann, a tenor and music teacher, had failed to live up to the family name. Right, that's enough. Stop. Enough. That's enough. How many times do I have to tell you? Just play the notes in the exercise. But, Papa, it's so beautiful. It's silly trash. Stop. Grandfather would have loved it. I said enough! We all hated the way his father treated him. But he was always boasting about his son. <laughs> Not in front of him, of course, but outside the family home. Oh, my Ludwig, my Ludwig, he used to say. In time, he'll become a great man in the world, you'll see. It was bewildering for Ludwig. He never knew what kind of mood his father would be in. And more and more, he withdrew into himself. It was clear that Beethoven's talent as a musician might provide an escape from his father. And when he got his first job, aged only 13, as deputy court organist, Beethoven's future suddenly seemed brighter. He began to study the work of Bach, Mozart and Haydn. And it's around this time you can see first evidence of his gift for composing. Since I was 12, my muse has often whispered to me, try and write down the harmonies in your soul. Only 12 years old, I thought. And how would I look as a composer? And what would men experience in the art say about it? I was almost shy, but my muse wished it, I obeyed and wrote. This is a work of astonishing sophistication for such a young composer. In the previous 20 years, sonatas had become the principal benchmark by which piano music was judged, so it says a lot for the young Beethoven's ambition that he was prepared to attempt this form so early on. something. Sea green frock coat, green knee breeches with buckles, stockings of black or white silk, shoes with black bow knots, the vest bound with real gold cord, hair groomed, hat on the left arm, sword with a silver belt. It was really quite something. <laughs> talking about him. A worthy successor to Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. My brother. I don't know. How can I tell? All I know is that his talent was a blessing for our family. Our grandfather's inheritance had almost run out. The father could barely support the family anymore. Once he started drinking, my brother's income was the only thing that kept us alive.
I guess you bastard. Come on now. I want you to play something beautiful for us. Brilliant, isn't he? You're my little genius. It's a bad time. Of course, your counterpoint will have to improve. It's quite inadequate, especially for... Sin Shut up! What did you just say? Come back here! You have nothing more to teach me! But I told you everything you know! I never understood why Ludwig's mother didn't step in. He certainly never criticised his parents in front of us. But I had the feeling that he'd given up relying on them. Ludwig. Beethoven found refuge at the home of Eleonora's family. He taught young Eleonora the piano. Her mother, Helene, doted on him. The whole of Bonn was talking about this young genius. But my mother was one of the few who understood how fragile he was. He was happiest when he was alone. Just him music. My mother knew that he needed protecting. She used to say to me, it's our job to keep the insects off the flower. But even music couldn't shield Beethoven from the deterioration of his family life. Ludwig's mother would shortly die from consumption, and his father's drinking problem grew steadily worse. At the age of 19, Beethoven's life reached a turning point. He realised he would have to take over as head of the household. And in a dramatic move, he wrote to his father's employer, the Elector of Bonn, asking that half his father's salary be paid to him. It was typical of Beethoven's boldness. And he got his way. By now, Beethoven had come to the attention of Bonn's rulers and through them was given his first big musical break. He was chosen to write the music for a cantata commemorating the death of Joseph II, the popular and modernizing Habsburg emperor who had embodied the ideals of the French Enlightenment. Close 
to the French border, Bonn had always been influenced by French Enlightenment thought. And the young Beethoven also found himself drawn to its values of virtue, reason, freedom and progress. Here as an idealistic and demanding young man, he penned this sublime tune, almost Mozartian in its effortless beauty. This soaring line, mankind climbs towards the light, has been called Beethoven's melody of humanity, and its shape, its melodic contour, we'll hear again and again in other works. What does it consist of? A rising figure, and up again, and then it turns back in on itself. So it's about an overall shape, not the specific notes, which makes it a motto theme, which is an ongoing obsession in Beethoven's music throughout his life. Unless my ears deceive me, you are playing flat. The whole of the last phrase was flat. Again, from the beginning. The work was rehearsed, but never performed in Beethoven's lifetime. It's an ambitious, elaborate piece, and at 800 bars, longer than anything he'd written before. The cantata was commissioned at a turning point in European history, and it's the first time we see Beethoven dealing with political ideas. The storming of the Bastille in France had sent shockwaves throughout the continent. And here, Beethoven seems to bid farewell to Europe's past by giving this work an image of an idealized golden age of aristocratic heroism just as so much of Europe is on the brink of devastating revolution. Beethoven had attained recognition in Bonn's aristocratic circles. It was now time for him to seek a wider horizon. His life in Bonn could only take him so far. He was well aware of that. And he had so much more to learn in Vienna. But he knew not to rely on anyone. That much he'd learned from his childhood. It's hard to say goodbye. It's something I know you have to do. But if only it weren't such a long way away. Eleonora would like to say goodbye. I'm late. I'm sorry. Please don't be angry with her. I wasn't able to return his love. 
and, in his usual way, he was angry with me for it. He wrote to me from Vienna, and slowly, we were able to be friends again. At the age of 21, Beethoven left Bonn behind him and set off to seek his fortune in Vienna, the musical capital of Europe. He arrived with an invitation to study with the world's greatest living composer, Joseph Haydn. Sit down over here. Over there. Now, I was shown a manuscript of your cantata when I visited Bonn. <laughs> yes, your patron, Waldstein? Yes. Yeah. He told me you were brilliant. <laughs> yes, he said, with a lot of hard work, you shall receive Mozart's spirit through the hands of Haydn. <laughs> And what do you make of that, then? Well, I would be um, honoured to study with you, Herr Haydn, but you know better than I do that every true artist must find his own path. Of course. An extraordinary young man. I wasn't surprised at his impatience. After all, I suppose this was a young man in a hurry. And I was a composer in my twilight years. But I sensed that in time he would give the world something to talk about. And I would be proud to call myself his teacher. Soon after he arrived in Vienna, our father died. I wrote to tell Ludwig, but uh, he didn't come back for the funeral. In fact, he never returned to Bonn. I was more than happy to follow him to Vienna. There was nothing in Bonn for me. I suppose, in a way, I was living in his shadow. Ludwig got on with his life. His new life. The death of his father meant that Beethoven could finally put his childhood behind him. Before long, he was being feted in the salons of the Viennese nobility as the city's most exciting newcomer. Nothing could hold him back. It's a novel. 
and I like it because of this novelty. Others may find it too complex. If I were you, I wouldn't publish this last one just yet. It needs more work. What's wrong with it? No, 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 nothing's wrong with it. I, I simply meant that um, this is a complicated work. Absolutely too much so. The public hasn't caught up with you yet. Perhaps they're not quite ready for this. Embarrassing, to say the least. All I meant to say was that the public may not take so readily to such a difficult and stormy finale. But the work was outstanding, it made me proud. And uh, I asked him uh, later if he would put Pupil of Haydn on the piece. It's a normal practice, but not for Beethoven. He refused outright. Perhaps it was necessary for the young composer to carve his own way. He needed to make his work distinct from that of his contemporaries or teachers like Haydn. And he does that here in the F minor piano sonata, setting himself challenging ground rules in order to express the maximum. Whereas composers like Haydn and Mozart might achieve contrast through key change, Beethoven here sticks pretty much to the one key, F minor. And he forces us to sit up and listen through the use of very clever localized effects. Repetition strange syncopated rhythms and extreme shifts between loud and soft. He's taken the idea of contrast to a much higher, more provocative degree. The feelings he aroused in his teachers were not confined to me alone. He was so stubborn so bent on having his own way that uh, many of us had our disagreements with him. He claimed, apparently, that I was jealous of him. But when you heard the work, how could one not feel it had all been worthwhile? Beethoven's early years in Vienna were characterized by his writing for the piano. And it's in these sonatas, private works intended for domestic and not public consumption, that we see the real masterpieces of his youth. With them, you have a sense that he's discovered his inner voice. It was his skill as a virtuoso pianist that propelled Beethoven to fame in Vienna. Within just a few years of his arrival, he was already wildly popular as the city's foremost improviser. Contenders would spar in contests where each had to improvise on a well-known piece of music. And to maintain his position, Beethoven had to see off the competition, taking on the heavyweights, 
aspect of the European music scene. <laughs> Beethoven, tonight, will meet more than his match, I believe. May I present the brilliant, the hitherto unbeaten, all the way from Paris, but don't hold that against him. <laughs> he's dexterous, he's dashing, he's debonair, he's Monsieur Daniel Steibelt. <laughs> Start. <laughs> we haven't got all day. the toast of our beloved Vienna. We know him, we love him. His finger work is finesse itself. But is he the best? Let's find out. Herr Ludwig van Beethoven! write to me from Vienna. He sounded so excited. Life was full of promise. If we met again, he told me, I'd find him very different. You'll see, he said, that a better life has done much to erase the traces of unhappy times. He was lionized by the aristocracy, adored by the wealthy, and <laughs> he even wrote to my husband Franz to say that there was love in the air. Despite what people say, I'm no misanthrope. You know that. And something's happened recently to lift my mood. This change has been brought about 
by an enchanting girl who loves me and whom I love. This is the first time I feel that marriage may bring me happiness. <laughs> of course, we were all delighted. He'd always had such difficulties with women, always falling in love, but somehow it never quite worked out. Well, he's talented. I mean, he's brilliant. He plays like a dream. And? And he's ugly. Well, he's not exactly ugly, but he doesn't make the best of himself, does he? He wears cheap, nasty jackets. I almost want to pay for him just to go to a tailor. <laughs> oh, but he has a kind of charm, a sort of magnetism. And he's written a sonata for me. I know. This hypnotic work was dedicated to Beethoven's pupil, Countess Giulietta Guicciardi, in 1801, and it only became known as the Moonlight Sonata years after Beethoven's death. He himself gave it the subtitle, Sonata in the Manner of a Fantasia, and it's this fantasy-like quality which builds on the huge talent Beethoven had for improvisation. Here we see that very gift, taken out of the public sphere into the private realm. It's very rare for a sonata of this period to begin with a slow movement of delicate, dreamlike texture, which sounds as if the pianist is spinning a spontaneous thread of expressive thought. And then there's the melody, almost a song without words. And in its lyrical and melancholic nature, which would have a great influence on 19th century romantics like Chopin, this work takes the piano sonata into dark, new territory. I understand you're going to be at Prince Nicholas's this Friday. No, I won't be going. Can't bear that crowd. But I shall be there. Well, no, how nice. I think we should move on to the next movement. Giulietta was one of many women with whom Beethoven would fall in love. Yet it wasn't just a fear of intimacy that stopped him getting too close. There was something else. I was lucky enough to be taken on as Herr Beethoven's assistant. An honour indeed. And as such, I was privileged to spend a great deal of time with him, just the two of us. Which sometimes meant knowing things about him the rest of the world has yet had no idea of. Have you seen the quintet yet? Yes. And I've marked the misprints. Why can't they ever get it right? Listen to that. It must be a shepherd. Beautiful, isn't it? What are you talking about? Flute. Listen, there it is again.
You're joking, aren't you? Hmm? Yes. Yeah, I must have misheard it. You asked about my present situation. Well, to the outside world, everything is fine. I'm being offered more work than I can possibly deliver, and I, I, I no longer even have to negotiate with people. I state my price, and they pay. But the truth is that that secret demon, my health, is destroying everything. My ears continue to buzz and hum day and night. Can you imagine what a disaster that is for me, a musician? I don't go out in public, just because I cannot possibly tell people I'm going deaf. Beethoven would lose his hearing slowly over the next 10 years. But the first symptoms of deafness, so ringing in his ears and an inability to understand people's speech, threw him into a panic. There wasn't a moment to lose. When he wrote to me again, there was a new sense of urgency in his voice. A determination, almost a mania. A feeling that time was running out. Everything Beethoven had fought for seemed in jeopardy. With typical defiance, he threw himself into his work and embarked on the most public form of artistic expression, a symphony. I live entirely in my music. I've barely completed one work before beginning another. At my current rate, I'm often composing three or four works at the same time. At the moment, I feel equal to anything. It's an extraordinary work, reflecting the swings between melancholia and exuberance which characterise this time for Beethoven. This last movement has a kind of ferocity about it. The music of a hooligan. This symphony sits on a fault line between the 18th and 19th centuries. It's still very much part of the tradition that Beethoven has inherited, but through its audacity, its aggression, and its sheer size, it's creating a whole new template. And more than ever, his unerring sense of himself as an artist is becoming clear. I can't possibly marry this man. I don't know what I was thinking. My head must have been turned by the music. I mean, obviously he's without rank or, or permanent position. I mean, what would my future be? Something else? All of Vienna's whispering about it. There's talk he might be losing his hearing. 
a musician. Can you imagine that? Hearing hasn't improved. In fact, I think it may be getting worse. And the lady I told you about is not of my class. So marriage is out of the question. And in any case, I really am far too busy with my music. state of mind was like then. Utter distress. Not only was that relationship doomed, but he was a man who, up until now, could do no wrong in Vienna, with a secret that could destroy all that. He began to avoid his friends. He stopped coming out in company. People thought he was downright rude. Not many of us knew the reason why. He left Vienna for a few months. I was worried. I tried to keep his business going for him back here, to give him a chance to relax. I think he pinned his hopes on the peace and quiet of the countryside, and the possibility that there must be something that could cure him. Beethoven traveled to a small village called Heiligenstadt outside Vienna. 
The move was to change everything, but not in a way he could have imagined. the baths, the infusions, none of them have worked. Now you're telling me there may be no cure. You people who think or say that I am hostile, stubborn, or misanthropic, how greatly you wrong me. You have no idea of the secret reason which makes me seem that way to you. I would have ended my life. It was only my art that held me back. I couldn't possibly leave the world until I had brought forth everything I felt was in me. Any idea I had that by coming here I would be cured, I must now give that up. As the autumn leaves fall and wither, so does my hope. Oh God, grant me at least but one day of pure joy. It's been so long since any real joy echoed in my heart. The long document that Beethoven wrote in Heiligenstadt, a letter to his brothers that flirted with the idea of suicide, was never sent. But in this letter, Beethoven had created a metaphor for his own heroism, death and rebirth. Bidding farewell to his old self, Beethoven embarked upon what he called his new way. And on his return to Vienna, he composed his most radical work to date, a symphony which he intended to dedicate to his political hero, Napoleon. But when Napoleon declared himself Emperor of France, Beethoven, feeling betrayed, withdrew the dedication. And he turned the symphony into what you might say is the story of his own heroic struggle. I was bound to be misunderstood, and I had to live alone, like someone who'd been banished. But now all this I've resolved to overcome. Significantly, he gave this symphony a title, Eroica. This was his passionate and defiant response to crisis. scale, ambition and complexity, the Eroica Symphony was a huge leap forward for Beethoven, immediately eclipsing the achievements of the second. He's demanding that the world perceive him as a true artistic hero, albeit a flawed one. He wrote 
to us that every day was bringing him closer to his goal. A goal he couldn't describe, but he could feel. You'll see, he said. I will be happy again. As happy as this world allows me to be. Resigned to his fate, he wrote, let my deafness no longer be a secret, even in art. After Eroica, Beethoven would create music of previously unimagined scale and brilliance. But the deeply personal crisis of losing his hearing was only the start of his difficulties. As he reached his peak as a composer, Beethoven would experience even greater struggles with the world around him. And now over on BBC4, join Charles Hazelwood in the new series Beethoven Uncovered as he takes a closer look at Beethoven's second symphony.